All right, this is uh, the third video in the series on um, microbiology for surgical technology students. And uh, in this video, we're going to go over other infectious organisms. In video two, we covered bacteria. Uh, here, we're going to start out um, with a form of bacteria, uh, ricochet. And uh, with ricochet, the, the difference is that uh, these bacterium are transmitted uh, by blood-sucking anthropods. So um, this would be things such as ticks, fleas, lice, mosquitoes. And so these are those that are uh, trans uh, transmitted by these bites. Uh, now, one of the important parts of this is um, that these are obligate intracellular uh, bacteria, uh, meaning that they have to live uh, intracellularly, they have to live in the cells, and so that's the reason it takes, um, uh, such as a um, mosquito that you know sucks the blood from uh, one animal, then biting another one, uh, or sucking blood from another one, transporting uh, that uh, the bacteria from the first to the second, uh, and thus um, infecting uh, the host. Uh, some of the ones that uh, you may be familiar with that are transmitted this way, um, you know, Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, some of the various typhoid fevers uh, are all um, uh, transmitted by anthropods. Right, algae. Uh, now, algae is going to be a little bit different here. You know, we have algae, we've got some that uh, is only visible by microscope, microscopic, and then those that you can see macroscopically. Uh, so uh, very wide range in sizes here. Uh, with the microscopic, um, these can be single-celled organisms uh, or uh, they can grow in long chains, filaments, may form colonies, so then become invisible by doing so. Um, the macroscopic, these are all multicellular, uh, and they uh, are the ones that you'll see, such as floating on the water um, in a stale or stagnant pond, um, as they've got the gas-filled bladders that help them uh, to float. Now, these occur both in fresh and salt water, uh, and there's a wide variety of forms. Now, the relationship, though, to humans is a little bit different. Uh, because they do not directly infect humans, so we do not get an algae infection. Uh, however, uh, the algaes uh, can sometimes have a uh, what they call a bloom or harmful al algae blooms. Um, this is going to be where you get a sudden growth of a significant amount of algae, and uh, if it's a a uh, certain type of algae, and we see this with red tide. Sometimes you'll see there will be so much of it that it causes coloring of the ocean water. Um, but when you get this sudden growth, and these do tend to happen more in tropical areas, uh, so warmer waters, um, these uh, will poison the fish. So uh, it ends up with a lot of fish being killed, but then fish that are contaminated that may not have died yet, uh, that somebody harvests to eat, you know, then eats it, then the person can get uh, poisoned by the fish. Um, so uh, paralytic shellfish fish poisoning is one of the uh, diseases that this can happen with, uh, but there is uh, several um, in this category. A positive interaction, though, with algae is that algae is our greatest producer of carbohydrates, so very important uh, in the food chain, so providing food to uh, other animals that we then consume. Uh, also because, and uh, also we can consume algae, so there are some algae that are part of health food nutrition um, that can also be a food source um, you know, directly. But uh, due to the large amount of algae that is present, uh, we do get a lot of our oxygen production from the algae also. Uh, so some good, you know, relationships there, some positives 
um, and very low on the infection side and in that it's not direct. So some of the uses for algae, food production, and oxygen. All right, protozoa. So uh, these are really cool. We found these in aquatic uh, environments. I can remember uh, in kin uh, not kindergarten, but in um, elementary school, my first introduction to, um, to microscopes and the teacher having people get some stale or stagnant pond water while well, I lived out in the country. And so uh, it was easy for me to find a pond and find a stale, stagnant area uh, to get some water so that we could look at it under the microscope and see uh, some of the some of the protozoa um, moving around. So really kind of a cool thing. But anyway, these are eukaryotic cells. Uh, so they do have nucleus and or uh, organelles. Um, they will move by cilia or flagella or pseudopodia. Pseudopodia uh, is kind of like um, um, movement of the parts of the cell and then the rest of it follows. Um, <clears throat> nutrition wise, um, these will bring in uh, water by penocytosis and then will bring in food by phagocytosis. We'll talk a little bit in anatomy uh, about the uh, different types of transport, active and passive transports. We'll talk about penocytosis and phagocytosis as two forms of active transport. Uh, penocytosis bringing in fluid and phagocytosis bringing in solid par particles or food uh, to, um, to the organism. Uh, they do uh, survive in aquatic environments and so um, the um, Oxygen diffuses through the cell membranes. That's how they get their oxygen. They need the moisture uh, to survive. Uh, you have to be careful. You don't want to dry them out. Um, if you, you get to see them moving around on your microscope slide if you don't dry them out. All right, so they move by the three different ways. And so when we get to this, we'll have subphylums and phylums that are, um, that are consistent with their locomotion. So... Um, part of that classification that's kind of in that middle between our domains and kingdoms and your genus species. Um, these are categorized by their locomotion. Um, so pseudopodia, the sarcodonia, um, amoeba are the ones that move that way. So um, and they will slime out a little bit and then and the rest of the body f uh, follows. So uh, I think that one's kind of cool, but anyway, cilia and flagella are also cool, but uh, anyway, it's kind of that amoeba moving. It's just, I don't know, uh, I think, you know, I should get me a pet amoeba um, to keep around, and, and uh, anyway, uh, just kind of cool. All right, <laughs> pathogenicity. Um, we can get infected by protozoa. Now, that's super scary when you think about it. If you look at those protozoa under... Uh, a microscope on a microscope slide and and see them moving around and then think about ooh I can get an infection of this that's kind of scary uh, so some of the things that uh, are familiar that um, are uh, infections of protozoa malaria uh, African sleeping sickness um, and uh, vaginitis so trichomonas vaginitis not all vaginitis uh, but trichomonas vaginitis is a, um, is an infection of uh, protozoa. We see the protozoas in aquatic environments, of course, like I mentioned earlier, stagnant, uh, more common in tropical areas due to the warmth. Uh, in areas of Africa, there's some, the setsi fly is the one that um, carries the sleeping uh, sickness and uh, there's some areas of Africa that are uninhabitable due to uh, the concentrations of, of setsi flies there um, in those areas and uh, the likelihood of, of uh, getting the African sleeping sickness from one. All right, and then fungi, yeast and mold. So um, we do have some that uh, are capable of growing as either, but let's start at yeast first. So yeast, single-celled, spherical, oval, cylinder, 
three to five micrometers in diameter. Now, I want to make sure that you see this right here. That's the symbol for micro. And so um, this is uh, 1,000 times or 1 1,000th of a millimeter. So a lot smaller um, than a millimeter. So this is a micrometer and uh, is not, that's not a typo there. Um, <clears throat> your molds are filamentous and so you've seen this uh, if you ever get like some mold grown on, on bread. So uh, another thing <clears throat> that I did in elementary school, you know, the teacher said, well, we want to look at some mold. So, you know, say, get a piece of old bread and get it a little moist and let it grow that mold. And if you let it just keep growing, it goes from just that flat mold that you see that it starts growing all the hypha. Um, and uh, really gets uh, quite incredible. So if you uh, have some old bread sitting around that you didn't throw out and you find it later, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but the molds form these filaments. Um, the filaments are important for the reproduction of the molds. Right. Di uh, diamorphic fungi, these are ones that are grow either as yeast-like cells or as mold. And so, um, <clears throat> these are the ones, most of the ones that cause disease are diamorphic fungi. And so they'll tend to grow as a mold and code and yeast and warm. Uh, so we typically find these as types of yeast infections um, on people. Whereas if that same microorganism was in a cooler environment, it would grow as a mold. Uh, so they do provide, uh, prefer a slightly moist environment. Um, yeast uh, reproduce by binary fission uh, and budding. So they can do either one. So binary fission is where you've got the one cell and it divides uh, in half, creating two individual cells. Budding is where you have the one cell and it buds off a little part of it that then separates and grows into a bigger and bigger cell. Modes, it goes back uh, to the hypha, and uh, that forms a germ tube then that allows for germination of the mode <clears throat> and reproduction of it. Fungi mostly causes uh, indirect issues with people, although we do have some infections we'll get to next, but they mainly affect plants. And so you can get you know, fungal infections of, um, of foods that you're trying to grow. So if you ever try to grow tomatoes, you'll know sometimes they'll get rust spots or your roses get rust spots on them. Those are uh, types of fungal infections of the plants. Um, most of the time, uh, the damage to our uh, food supply is the most direct uh, problem with fungi. And so it can destroy and reduce food supply in areas. And there's places in our world where uh, any major change like this can really cause havoc and uh, can lead to true starvation and deaths from loss of food supply. We don't think about that a lot uh, where we live, but... Um, you know, if, uh, there's some places where a bad uh, spread of a fungus of the crops can really take out the food supply for a group uh, that they're dependent on for that year. Um, the, we can react to the toxins that are formed. We can have allergic reactions to them. Um, but then the ones that are actually grow on or in persons is mycosis. So that is an infection with the fungi. So some of them, uh, the ones that you're, one that you're most likely to be familiar with um, is a yeast infection, Canada Abacans. Uh, and so this is diaper rash. Um, and uh, also we've got uh, variations of it, that, you know, as far as um, athlete's foot, things like that are fungal infections. Uh, so most do stay superficial and on the skin. Uh, now, we can get intermediate and systemic or deeper infections, um, a uh, uh, infection of the respiratory 
would be pneumocystis carnea. And so that is a um, infection of the lungs by a fungal, um, um, fungal infection. All right, and of course, uh, widespread fungal disease of plants is uh, where we're going to see most of the um, most of these. And then, last but not least, of course, is viruses. Now, a big difference here from um, other um, microorganisms is viruses are non-living, so these do are non-living, uh, whereas uh, everything else, however, other microorganisms are. And so viruses are non-living forms and can infect all other forms of life, including bacteria. Um, <clears throat> now these can be uh, described taxonomy-wise based on their genome structure, um, but uh, are often, if we're talking about it medically, will be grouped by their route of transmission, so such as a respiratory virus, most common that we uh, talk about, but enteric, um, being in the GI system, um, zoonosis, STDs. Um, so different types of viruses are based or often grouped on their route of transmission more medically wise than, uh, than discussing the scientific taxonomy of it. All right, the shape of the viruses, uh, these uh, have nucleic acid. They'll have some DNA or RNA uh, included in a capsid. Um, this um, is the part that uh, viruses, what they're trying to do is for them to replicate, they've got to infect something else. They've got to infect a cell and they will reproduce the DNA or RNA in that cell. So some carry DNA, some carry RNA. Either one can be reproduced though. And uh, so the virus then continues to grow and spread by reproducing this DNA or RNA um, in uh, the host cell. Uh, now these do have a um, component around it, a protein membrane, lipid membrane protein coat that surrounds that. Um, and then they will have some sort of attachment proteins or spikes um, that will bind the virus to the cell uh, that it's infecting. So let's look at some shapes of these um, that are kind of common in the bacteriophages, ones that um, infect a bacteria, gives you kind of the most clear uh, look at this as this upper part is the capsid that uh, contains the uh, DNA or RNA. And then these attachment proteins here uh, will attach to the cell. So that kind of attaches and then the DNA can then penetrate into the cell, be reproduced, and then create more virus. Uh, now, we're, of course, very familiar now with uh, coronaviruses that are going to be shaped uh, in the spherical shape, and these have the attachment proteins all around them, um, and then we've got a couple of other versions here. So, uh, we'll look at how these reproduce, uh, then next, the uh, lysogenic cycle, how it makes a new uh, virus. Now, uh, worth also noting these um, membranes on these, um, such as the coronavirus. One of the reasons that soap and water works really good is many times these are a lipid-based coating. And if you can uh, break down the fats, which soap does, then that uh, destroys the virus as uh, the lipid is there to uh, protect the virus. And so if you can break that down by washing with soap and water, uh, which it does very efficiently, and then the virus is killed. So that's why uh, soap and water is um, you know, more effective in general than hand sanitizer, is it's actually destroying it by um, penetrating that lipid coat. 
All right, so the lysogenic cycle, this is the reproduction of a virus. And so if you think about those spikes attaching and then penetrating into that cell um, so that the, uh, the virus penetrates the cell so that the DNA or RNA from the virus, uh, from that capsid, then can be inserted into the actual living cell be it a human cell or a bacterium, um, then it is um, transcribed in there and replicated. So you get a replication of the virus DNA and proteins. So you get the stuff, the building blocks then here of a new virus, and then those assemble and create new virus, and then that virus releases, and you have release of the new virus. So uh, you end up creating, uh, you know, reproducing an, an identical virus by uh, essentially using, hijacking the DNA and RNA uh, of the, uh, the DNA of the cell that it has attached to and uh, creating a new virus. So then that destroys the cell uh, that it had attached to. Pathogenicity, uh, wide range. So these can be from uh, something acute in which you expect full recovery. So if you get the flu, you typically are going to recover. Um, now there are also acute infections that cause permanent damage. So a good example of that one is polio. And it's something that you don't see much anymore, but uh, someone that's had polio typically uh, will have long-term loss of muscle function <clears throat> and will have difficulty walking, moving about, and can even have difficulty breathing uh, if it was a severe case of polio. Chronic or slow infection, something that sticks around would be, example, would be HIV. Uh, some of these viruses, um, some such as um, like chickenpox, once you've got it, it will stay around dormantly and then could reappear later in life as shingles. So another uh, example of uh, something that may stick around long term. All right, and then prions. This is something that um, you don't hear a whole lot about. And uh, we don't have to face this much, but it is uh, something that is important to um, sterilization of instruments. And that's due to Crutchfield-Jacobs disease. Uh, this is mad cow disease is what this is. Mad cow. Now the problem is, is this infects the brains of the cow. That's making them mad. Yeah. They're not happy. It is a really not fun uh, encephalitis. Um, it uh, creates, creates a mushiness of the brain. So that's why we use the term transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. So this is a uh, uh, infection of the brain that just makes it smushy. Okay, so where these uh, come important to us, it's like, okay, well, what, what, what's the big deal? Uh, so, you know, if you were to eat the meat from a mad cow, you could get Crutchfield Jacobs. So it's very easily transmittable. Um, and then your problem is, is when you do get a patient that is sick with mad cow um, with Crutchfield Jacobs, we don't tell them that they're sick with mad cow, but uh, you get a patient that is a Crutchfield Jacobs uh, patient. And this is rare, but it does occur. We cannot sterilize those instruments. And so typically these patients are coming in to get a biopsy, um, a biopsy of the brain tissue uh, to get a confirmed diagnosis of the Crutchfield Jacobs. So um, if it's suspected, then we uh, should use disposable instruments. Uh, those instruments uh, have to be tracked as um, they, after they're used, uh, they have to be placed in a, um, uh, in a biohazard container that is tracked from that point of where they're used in that room 
uh, all the way to the point that we've got confirmation that that was destroyed, that those were incinerated. And so um, this is one of those things where you know, it just takes a whole different, you know, you need to get supervisors involved at this point. So if you get, if you're working in your own, you get one of these patients, uh, somebody should have a protocol for how this is handled. Um, now there are extending, extended sterilization cycles that could be done. The thing is, the best thing to do is to use, um, because it's, it's just really hard to kill the prions. Uh, so for these, it's best to use a limited amount of instrumentation, um, either disposable instruments or just, you know, very limited set, what you need to get the job done. And then all that has to be destroyed and tracked uh, because what happens, and this has happened in the U.S., um, two, three years ago, uh, a case where this was not done correctly. Um, and it's well known. We've been talking about this for years uh, in the OR, but uh, they did not follow the proper protocols. Those instruments were used on additional patients. They were autoclaved by standard autoclave, uh, uh, autoclaving protocols sterilization protocols, and they were not sterile. These prions were not killed uh, by, those, um, by that sterilization, thus infecting additional patients with Crutchfield-Jacobs uh, that those instruments that were used on after the initial patient. Uh, so this is one of those weird things, odd things, rarely that you have to deal with, uh, but it really should follow proper protocols when you do. All right, so this ends video uh, three. This is a little bit shorter one. Uh, then we'll come back with video four and look at some of these common microbes and the diseases that they cause.